Okay, um, so it is a couple of minutes after 530. So we will go ahead and get started with our presentation this evening. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening for tonight's presentation of uh, the visual arts and indigenous health, which is the first topic for this health justice futures virtual arts and literature mixer that um, is hosted by the Southwest Health Equity Research Collaborative at Northern Arizona University. So just very briefly, I will introduce myself as the, your host for tonight and also facilitate, facilitator of the discussion with our invited guest. We have Lavandria Noki, who is a Diné artist, as well as Garrett Etsidi, who is also a Diné artist. But very briefly, I do also want to give some time to introduce uh, my colleague and also my co-host, Alexandra uh, Semeron Longorio, um, who is also the brains behind this uh, creative project that is being sponsored by um, our center here at NAU. She will, for the most part, be behind the scenes tonight. So let me go ahead and give her a chance to introduce herself and say hi, and then we'll get on with the program. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Alexandra Samarron Longorio. I am a uh, research coordinator at the Center for Health Equity Research. And um, Carmen and I have been leading this effort of the Furnace First campaign. And part of that is kind of this series of health justice futures to reimagine together the possibilities of what um, health justice means and how it can look like in our community. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Yes, thank you, Alexandra. And again, my name is Carmen Lita Chief. Uh, I am a citizen of the Navajo Nation. And very briefly for a lot of my Dana relatives who are out there, uh, I will introduce myself using our kinship system. So uh, I am originally from Kayenta, Arizona, and I am a senior program um, coordinator with the Southwest Health Equity Research Collaborative at NAU. And um, from here, I will go ahead and advance our slide forward. In just a bit, we'll be able to um, hear from our um, invited guests tonight, and they'll have a chance to introduce themselves. But I do want to spend some time giving you all a primer um, about the Health Justice Future series. It is a bi-monthly um, virtual mixer. So the next one will occur not next month, but um, two months from now. But this one on Indigenous visual arts and health is our first in this series. It is a part of the Fairness First campaign, which is sponsored by the Southwest Health Equity Research Collaborative at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, Arizona. And, and to clear up any confusion as to why, you know, on the left, you see the logo, it says the Center for Health Equity Research. Uh, the acronym, acronym for that is SHARE. So SHIRC is actually a part of the Center for Health Equity Research. Um, so it's like the umbrella center that all of our different initiatives are housed under. So um, if you are wondering about that, uh, that's why we are mentioning both SHARE and SHIRK in tonight's presentation. So with that, let me advance forward. So, you know, before we get into this robust discussion uh, with our guests regarding health justice and the intersection with creative expression and um, how that is used as a tool for advocating for the health of our indigenous communities, um, I do want to give us a chance to just, you know, sit with this definition um, that we have of health justice. So this is just a starting point for our conversation tonight, but a lot of the way that we envision health, health justice uh, really comes from a lot of our, live, our own lived experiences, what we confront from day to day, uh, some of the limitations, the challenges, the opportunities. So not 
everybody has the same amounts. Uh, we all vary in the, in, you know, the different opportunities that are afforded to us, as well as um, the challenges and some of the obstacles that we confront in our everyday life through structural and systemic uh, means. And so for us tonight, we just want to lay the groundwork. So for from me and Alexandra, we conceptualize health justice as the result or the outcome of communities having the resources, the social and political power to live well in balance and live in a world free of structured biases and inequities. So health justice for us is really a call to action that listens to the lived experiences of communities and prioritizes collective participation and the creation of a future where everyone can thrive. And so I want us to just kind of linger on the last three words where every one, every single person can thrive. So just making sure everybody has what they need in order to live, you know, a happy life. And a lot of that is embedded in our indigenous philosophies on wellness. So from here, um, we just wanna offer additional resources with other definitions of health justice. So if you wanna visit that at, a, at another time, please feel welcome to do so. So before we jump into our grand presentation tonight, we wanna to hear from you all, our audience members up there. We actually have about 40 participants tonight. So we're very curious to um, hear from where you are joining us from. So there's a couple of ways that you can offer that. Um, if you have your phone uh, next to you, if you're joining us, you can use your phone to scan that QR code. It should take you to uh, a site called Poll Everywhere. You can um, go to that link down at at the bottom where it says pollev.com slash forward slash shirk NAU473. Or if you have your phone handy and you're a texter, you can just text shirk NAU473 to um, the number 37607 to join. So we'll give folks um, a couple of minutes to connect with that. And from there, I'm going to allow Alexandra to share her screen so that we can see a lot of these answers pop up in real time. Okay, so look at that. The cloud is growing. We have a lot more additions coming in. So if you're not familiar with the word cloud, what happens is you'll see that Flagstaff is the largest word, the location on there that we see. And that's telling us that a lot of our participants tonight who are joining are joining us from Flagstaff. But we also have Tempe, we have, um, oh my goodness, we have Flagstaff, Window Rock, Haute Villa, Sunnyside, Shiprock. So all over, it sounds like we're concentrated, looks like we're concentrated in um, Arizona, you know, parts of New Mexico, so the Southwest. Thank you all for indulging us in that little exercise. So let's go ahead and move forward. So the reason why um, we, we thought it was important just to share that location and get some interaction going is because, oh my goodness, that's not good. Um, it's because a lot of, uh, you know, we have a strong connection to place when it comes to our indigenous conceptualizations of health, our understandings of health. And so it's really important to be grounded in, in that. Um, when we say our clans, as I did earlier this evening, um, it's really telling to a connection to specific places um, on Navajo territory, Navajo land to which, you know, I come from. And so it, 
place and location and space, ge geographical space is very important to us um, when we think about health and wellness. Secondly, and I very much apologize for this, there was other images here. So I just briefly wanna give a primer um, on indigenous health, but I'm realizing I'm realizing um, I did not give a chance for our artists to introduce themselves before I get into this component. So let me segue and allow them to do that. So um, we have Lavandria Anoki, and then we'll hear from Garrett. Um, where are you from? Where are you joining us from? Uh, where are you originally from? All that good stuff. Hi everyone, my name is Liv and hopefully, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, I'll introduce you all, um, I guess I'll do my clans. Uh, I am Dana from Ganado, Arizona, currently living in Flagstaff, Arizona. Thank and you. I'm very excited to be here. I'll pass it to Garrett. Hello. Good evening, guys. Um, my clans are Torichini, um, Tohiglini, Keani, and Nakhe uh, Dene. For those who are not too familiar with our clan system, um, Torichini is a uh, bit of water, Tohiglini is uh, water flows together, and uh, Keani is a uh, towering house. And my last clan is Nakhe Dene, which is Mexican clan. <laughs> And um, as us being connected as indigenous people, you know, that's how we identify and keep ourselves grounded. So I'm from Chingley, Arizona, um, from a place in Valley Store called um, Bonzagas, um, a story that was um, told to me by my elders, meaning when you do your very best to climb up a cinder pit or a hill, you keep sliding down. So the story was my great, 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 great grandmother was getting chased by the U.S. Calvary during the time of the long walk. And she was getting um, pretty much, um, they were following her up that, following her through the Chingley Valley when she was escaping. And as, as soon as she got up to the Cinder Hill with her horse, she rode on top of it. And she yelled, you cannot catch me. I'm too, I'm too swift. I'm too quick for you guys. And she hightailed off from there. Uh, it was a really unique story that I, that was, and pretty much was shared with me through uh, my grandfather uh, on my, my paternal grandparents, and that was on my dad's side. And right next door where I lived at was my uh, maternal grandfolks, and they, that was a place called Maibatol, that's where my mother's from. So um, right now, I'm currently residing in Phoenix. I'm working as a counselor for the Gila River Tribe. Nice to meet you guys. Looking forward to this presentation. Yes, thank you very much for both introducing yourselves. So um, I figured out why our pictures were not showing up on the slide and it's probably um, some universal divine inter intervention. It was probably signaling to me that, hey, you didn't introduce, you didn't allow the guests to introduce where they're from. Um, so that's really important, as I was saying before, um, in our conceptions of health. Um, so place is very important, location. Uh, there's other, you know, and this is a very condensed explanation of how we view uh, the pillars of indigenous health. Um, so next, uh, definitely relationships are very important. And I know that a lot, it seems like a lot of our participants who are joining us tonight are indigenous. And so this uh, will probably you know, resonate a lot with you. So what we did earlier that uh, Liv, Garrett and I, we offered our clans um, that gives us a chance to see how we are connected to each other. So connected to place and also connected to each other and how do we greet each other? Because our roles within, you know, our kinship roles or family roles, how we are related to each other actually structures our behaviors to one another. It also structures our communication um, with each other. And so another tenet of 
indigenous health is also culture. So we'll read a lot in the public health literature about all of these various um, quantitative, qualitative, and mixed method studies that are done in public health research. And one of the central understandings from those research studies is that um, overwhelmingly part native participants will say that cultural teachings, traditions, think, you know, those things that we, that we ascertain from our family members, our community members about what it means to be indigenous, what it means to be Diné, what it means to be Hopi, what it means to be Anishinaabe, uh, all of that does stem from our collective um, indigenous knowledge systems and that's inherent in our cultures, how we do things, how we see things, how we interact and understand the world around us and the environment and each other. And then last of all, we have spirituality. So that is a, a, a big tenet of indigenous health and Liv and Garrett will probably speak to this um, what, during their presentation tonight. But spirituality, all of these different things are connected. They're interdependent, they're interconnected with each other. So you cannot um, have one without the other because it will cause a ripple in the way everything is held together when we think about you know, um, wellness for everybody, wellness for all of our indigenous relatives in our communities. So with that, I do wanna move forward. I wanna give some time to our presenters to speak. But before that, I just wanna, you know, provide a primer about what we mean, why we, why we named this series Health Justice Features. So we talked about health justice. We're talking a little bit, very, you know, very briefly glossing over indigenous health and the tenets of indigenous health. But we also want to, to recognize that settler colonialism is a, is a big um, part of some of the things that we see um, in our indigenous communities, like the manifestations of disharmony, of, um, of, of ill health, um, unhealthy conditions. And so um, very, you know, I'm not gonna go too deeply into this because this could be its own series on its own. But when we talk about settler colonialism, it's a specific form of colonialism. So it's like a domination from a foreign entity over um, another group population of people. And so settler colonialism is very specific. And the anthropologist um, Patrick Wolf has, and he cited a lot in a lot of this indigenous health literature, he says that colonialism, settler colonialism is a structure and it's not an event. So what tends to happen is when we look at specific points in history, we're looking at specific events. And so what happens is that we should be broadening our perspectives and looking at all of those collective events together and really seeing the commonalities of what makes those things happen time after time after time along this historical time continuum. And it's then that we start to see, you know, these systems and these structures that allow um, settler colonialism to, um, to thrive. And so um, other scholars like Tuck and Yang have said, settlers come with the intention of making a home on the, on the land, a homemaking that insists on settler sovereignty over all things in their new domain. So the other thing about settler colonialism is it is inextricably inextricably tied to land, okay? So it's all about acquiring more land and you'll see at the very bottom, settler co colonialism always needs more land. So it is a land centered project. And so settler colonialism is also foundational to modernity. So it's, I guess in order for modernity to manifest and to be um, it can't happen without settler colonialism and all the different things that allow it to exist and thrive. So it needs land. Again, that's a very, very brief simplification of what that is. 
So we have um, Jennifer Danette Dale, who is now at the University of New Mexico, but she's a Diné historian, and I believe she's our first Diné historian. She says that settler colonialism requires the destruction of indigenous peoples, including their relationship to the land. Again, you know, settler colonialism requires land and the appropriation of indigenous labor as resources. And it's very impactful to share here uh, a picture of Dogo's do lead, which is um, in English, uh, colonizers, settlers have named this mountain um, San Francisco Peaks and it's right here in Flagstaff. Um, every tribal nation in this region has their own name for this mountain. It's integral to our identities. It's integral to our wellness. And so again, going back to that concept of land and how it's important to our health, but how also settler colonialism comes in and also needs land in order to exist. So, you know, we have these two forces coming at each other for, for a competition of land, not competition of land, but like the necessity of land to thrive. And very briefly, you know, the, the, the ending word, the last word in health justice futures is talking about futures. And there's this growing artistic movement in our indigenous communities, um, which really focuses on how can we reimagine decolonial futures for indigenous peoples. Uh, this term was, was coined by Grace Dillon in her 2003 book, Walking the Clouds. And it's really about um, requiring the use of our, the power of our imaginations of possible futures for indigenous people. And so Garrett and Liv are also gonna be talking about how does that intersect with the work that they do. So from here, you know, that was a lot of talking. So we do wanna give some space to you all who are joining us. Um, again, you know, either scan that QR code, uh, text that information or visit that website there and let us know what does health justice mean to you. We're very curious because I think it's also <clears throat> gonna feed into the conversations that will be had with Liv and Garrett. Okay, so Alexandra, if you want to share that screen as people are typing in their answers, uh, what does health justice mean to you? How do you define it? So from the various roles that you hold, whether you're Indigenous or non-Indigenous, uh, a mother, a father, an uncle, public health professional, maybe a health practitioner, um, yeah, let us know what does it mean to you? So we're starting to see some answers come in. It means community, equity for all, access, being heard. It means um, inclusion, being included. This one's a biggie. Health justice means changing the system completely to provide for all in individuals equally. And then right above it, equitable distribution of healthcare that undermines the historic history of systemic racism. For one person, it means balance. And for another person, it means reimagining health and well-being. Again, going back to those terms of imagination and the power of that. And we know that in our indigenous um, teachings and philosophies, there's a lot of emphasis on the power of thought and the power of word. Uh, those things are together are very powerful and recreating possibilities for oneself. So we have autonomy and responsibility and also allowing us to reach our full health potential. So thank you for participating. Um, it, it's sounding like, you know, this is a, a huge, uh, there's some huge commonalities in the way that we do see health justice. So moving forward, 
share my screen. Thank you again. So at this point, um, the first person we are going to hear from is Liv. And so Liv is also going to share how she understands and experiences health justice and how that intersects with her work. So with that, um, Liv, take it away. Thank you, Carm. Appreciate it. I am going to share my screen. If you don't mind. Sure. We see it. Thank you. So um, I'll give you my understanding of health justice. And this comes from experience as a mother and also as a behavioral health professional provider. So I am in um, a very specific field of behavioral health called applied behavior analysis. Um, this is the degree in which I earned my um, master's certificate in. And I very briefly um, write functional behavior assessments and behavior change plans. These are the plans that I would give to behavioral health teams um, doctors, families, um, to help support behavioral changes for our clients, family members. And, um, you know, being a provider, I have the opportunity to know what it's like to be on the inside, but I also am a mother of a child with autism. And so I utilize these services myself. And so I have the unique experience of being able to know what it's like to sort of see the inside happenings, but also know the challenges that we face trying to seek out the services for our son. So, um, you know, we've been through crisis, we've been through ER, we've had to call police officers, we've had to deal with DCS um, for neighbors that didn't really understand what was happening. And it, it's, it's a challenge. It's safe to say that it's, it's it, it can be extremely overwhelming. Um, and so for me, health justice, you know, we've, we've heard a lot of people give a lot of the words that I think it is. And it's equality, it's access, it's fairness. It's rooted in everyone being able to access quality health care because that doesn't happen right now. And we are, we are in 2021 and we are still struggling with these things. And, you know, things that happen from a, provi a provider's point of view is that it really becomes very focused on the capitalistic part of the service. So I'm being pushed to bill certain codes. So I'm being given a really giant clientele. I have a, I have a hefty load. Um, it's unfair for those clients and it's unfair for me. Um, it's really hard to have such a high level um, clientele and not be able to effectively give them quality services. And it's also not fair for me to objectify them, making them the object of a billable line item. So I struggle with that day in, day out. That's something that I've, I've tried to speak with my supervisors on up about, you know, how do we change these systems? How do we make it fair so that we see these people as people and not numbers, right? They're not dollars, they're people. They come in with by the time they reach us, most of the time, they are at their wits end and they are screaming for help. And what a huge difference it would make if we could actually service them through the generosity of our hearts and the things that we want to do best for humanity. For, for, for humanity. And so that's sort of what health justice means to me um, in relation to my art. This is a first go round of a logo that was established, I wanna say around 2010. And in 2010, I started focusing on my artwork and really getting into art shows. 
Um, these are some of the first things I did. And so I identify as a protein artist. I um, paint, I sew, I bead. I am a classically trained ballerina. I'm a classically trained pianist. So I very much kind of dabble a little bit in everything. And so these are some of the first few items that I entered into some of the art markets that I was starting out to do in 2010. There's a gigantic pause because I had babies and they became my primary focus. And so this is sort of where I started. But this is an acrylic painting that I did last year. And from here forward, a lot of what you're gonna see is a lot of hummingbirds. And the reason why this is so meaningful to me is because every time I am visited, and so this is really cool too, because it's raining where I am right now. And the subject matter that I'm getting into is just super, it's just extraordinarily meaningful to me. And so I take that as a sign as well. So um, the hummingbird to me is my grandmother. Uh, she loved hummingbirds. That's what I can remember of her and always will remember about her. And every time I see one, uh, I, I take that as a sign of her visiting. And so she, she is our protector. And so every time I see the hummingbird, I think of these things. I think of her blessing us. I think of us. Um, not being alone, I think of us always having our ancestors um, praying for us, still listening to us and making sure that we're well. And this is another piece. This is again acrylic on a denim jacket. And then this is a mural that I did at Flagstaff High School. And this one has a fun story because last year, the end of the year, was an extremely difficult, challenging year for us. Um, you know, if you've ever had one of those years where you don't know what you're going to do and where you're going to pony up to get your, you know, power to go forward, that was how last year was for us. And um, this image actually came to me. October 19th last year at 2.21 a.m. I had a dream about this image popped up in the middle of the night, sketched it out really quick, took a picture of it. And that picture right there is essentially what became this picture here. And so embedded in this image is a number of things here. And what's important about this again is that you have the symbolism of the hummingbird there, which is important to me. But beyond that, embedded in this picture is just to me, so I named this Morning Blessings. And really what this is, is it's an acknowledgement of eh. And in Navajo, eh is um, our relationships. So in here, we've got an abstract of the ghost lead here, the mountain is there, the morning dawn is coming out, our home is here. And then we just have this gigantic hummingbird against the star here. And really it's just, to me was, we are well, we are happy, we have all our relations here and your ancestors are watching over you. So when you come out in the morning, it's a reminder to go out face east to your morning prayers, that's the time that you receive your blessings. Without doing that, life is gonna be challenging and difficult. So it was a reminder for me during that time that I needed to go out and remember to connect with everything. So I needed to connect with all these beings that I have just mentioned here to go to sleep, the sun, um, you know, the birds, everything that is life gives me and my, my family life. And so it's a huge difference to think about wellness and health in respect to what it means as, as a Diné woman having a um, indigenous lens as opposed to 
a Western lens. So a Western lens identifies and defines wellness and health as something that's extremely individualized. Um, you know, we forget to think about our relationships and how important and necessary they are. So in Navajo, all our relations are very important. That's the meaning of, of health and wellness is being connected to our relatives. Um, and through art, art gives me, art is a, I would say it's a link. It is a connector to people, to these types of different types of thought processes. And so art for me helps to facilitate a different way of thinking about ourselves. And um, health and, and wellness in general. And it's, it's more of a, so I, I would say that it's more of a, it, it's not a linear thought process. It's not static, it's very circular. So I'm doing art and then in, in my art, I'm thinking of all these things and there's a sense of wellness and family tied into all of that. And these are some of the things that I do in my individual, individual artwork. Um, so I embed little sayings just to give the space happiness. I think a lot of art has, you know, there's always a story behind art. I like to embed little pieces of happiness into there. Um, so this is the wall that I just did. I was covering this where it says love lives here was actually covered by that giant hummingbird, but I knew I wanted to leave a little message there. This is a mask that I, this mask was actually done for Garrett. And I don't, he doesn't know this, but this is the message that was embedded inside his mask. And so it wow. says, yes, always to you. So you would never know that Garrett. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, thank you so much. And so that's, you know, my art, it's, it's um, it comes from good intention and it's a connector back to what the real meaning of health and wellness means through a Diné indigenous lens. Wow, thank you very much, Liv. I loved all of that. And for our audience, um, remember in the very beginning I was, I, I offered four I guess pillars of indigenous health. And I think what Liv spoke to really resonated with um, family, the kinship, even uh, the story about her dreaming about the design um, and how that influenced her art, I think speaks a lot to that connection to spirituality and how all of that is integral to our wellness. And how do we carry that forth? How do we communicate that forward? Um, at this point, we are going to allow you all to take a small break, uh, get a drink of water, um, stretch if you need to. So we'll give you just a few minutes to do that. And as soon as uh, time is up, we'll go ahead and welcome Garrett to provide a presentation. And right after Garrett's presentation, we'll open up for um, a general collective combined interactive Q&A session with our audience. And for those of you who are holding strong, maybe also take this time to think of some questions that you might have for Liv when we get to that portion of our, of our um, event tonight.
Okay, so I'm just over here enjoying all the conversation that's going on in our chat box. And it's nice to see all of those supportive messages um, to live. And now we will hear from Garrett at City, who is our second art artist for tonight. Alrighty, thank you so much. Alrighty, we'd like to give thanks to um, Harm and the NAU staff for having me here on today's topic on visual art and, and Indigenous health. Um, it's an honor to share my work with you guys. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. Alrighty, could you guys see that? Yes, yes, we can. All right, cool. All righty, could you guys hear me loud and clear? Check, check, check. All good. All righty. Well, um, I'd like to say again, thank you. Um, my name is Garrett Etsity. Uh, you could um, visit my website, www.garrettetsity.com. Uh, feel free to browse through it. I have shirts, I have stickers, I have um, some originals, so feel free to contact me about that. Um, so we're going to start off with um, house justice. So to me, house justice, as being an artist, a counselor, a brother, an uncle, uh, grandfather, due to my nieces having kids, you know, uh, it's more like establishing a connection to your identity, um, how we see ourselves as indigenous peoples, indigenous people in our communities. Um, long ago, during the time of the boarding school era, you know, they wanted us to strip all indigenous people of our, of our identity. The slogan from the military was to save the man, you must kill the Indian. That meant meaning completely destroying the people's identity, you know, our identity. Health justice in a way, how I could relate it is more like health reconnection having the tools, having the stories to connect back to our roots, um, to build healthy communities, especially for the youth, our kids, and helping them identify what it is, you know, how to maintain a living environment, your backyard, your living space. Um, so with that, you know, it's more to me, I believe it's like connecting the youth, you know, back to their traditional roots through culture, um, like dancing, art, songs, and storytelling. And the agenda that I'm going to go with as a cultural identity as an artist, that's one. Uh, second is uh, connecting with health justice and health restoration with my art, the future on cultural preservation and um, a portfolio of my current works and questions afterwards, okay? So as an artist, um, my primary audience has always been the youth. I, I grew up from a difficult environment. Um, it took a while for me to identify true self. I was uh, slightly pretty much confused as a child, you know, what my identity was, you know, it took me a while for me to be connected. Um, pretty much one day, you know, my grandfather took the initiative to take me to a ceremony, my grandfather and my paternal grandfolks. And from there, you know, it, it, 
I was inspired, you know, of connecting back into my roots. I was inspired of um, identifying who I am as a in the human being, you know, living here on earth. And what's the purpose of living on earth? And through that, you know, as an artist, you know, I grew up starting with, you know, I've been observing the canyon walls, been observing the sand paintings, uh, certain uh, petroglyphs. And with that, you know, with the stories that was passed down from my elders, um, it was like me connect, reconnecting to my roots and to help me develop mentally, you know, emotionally, physically, and most importantly, spiritually. And in the way, what my elders did for me was help me, you know, work with, you know, house restoration, you know, identifying who I am as a young man being here on planet Earth, learning how to be a male, learning how to know what male responsibility is and also female responsibilities of uh, maintaining a home and learning how to obtain, it, obtain certain goals for yourself. So my art, in a way, is um, health restoration, health justice, through connecting with oral stories that was um, passed with my elders. Um, as for as for assisting, you know, what I do as a counselor, I help the youth, you know, have an, an interest of connecting back to the roots through art. You know, sometimes they don't have that interest and they're so distracted by what the media is putting out there. So me connecting with them, you know, with the art that they look and they are attracted to it. It defines, um, you know, of them having that interest of um, connecting their culture with the art as I help them, you know, create art. So with that, you know, helping them building uh, an identity is the first part of building that um, I guess you could say uh, relationship is primary and that's what we always taught in our culture is, is building that relationship when you um, greet uh, an individual or anyone who you don't know. So in a way it keeps them having, it kind of helps them identify what a foundation is of their living circle. Um, creating art, you know, with, with the kids is a beautiful thing um, on helping them giving a voice to the voiceless because the youth, you know, don't really express themselves through the English language, especially with our indigenous children from rural communities. Um, English is still new to us as people. We're still new to how to express how we move about, you know, with our emotions. And a lot of that as indigenous people, we used to communicate through art, through the petroglyphs um, on the canyon walls to um, sand painting, you know, that's how we communicated once upon a time. And again, you know, with that, you know, the kids I work with, they're really intelligent little human beings that I enjoy. And um, like I said, you know, with art, you know, we, um, we, we looked at it in a way with the kids when I work with the kids is knowing what language is, what is self-expression. And um, I educated them, that, you know, as indigenous people, you know, sign language was our first communication once upon a time for tribes to communicate with one another. And through the petroglyphs on the, on the bottom of the, of the mountains, there were actually, you know, signs of how to provide for certain communities who are traveling through of guiding them where to find water, where to get resources, where to, um, you know, get some moccasins. And those um, handwritings, those um, connections, as you could, I guess there was some research recently, and a lot of my elders always said that, you know, if you would grab a, a tribal, you know, elder from back in the day from up in the Shoshone reservation, all the way up down to the South, South Americas and through the Southwest, we could communicate through sign language. We can communicate through connecting with the petroglyphs. So in a way, that's how, to me, you know, connecting the youth of identifying themselves, having themselves like, you know, being uh, aimed towards through art. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and move forward. Um, starting 
pretty much I want to share some recent works that I did. And this uh, beautiful piece that I created is uh, a picture of my niece. Uh, she's a beautiful human being. Her name is Njonaba Carol at City, and the title is uh, The Spirit of Resilience. Uh, it's a uh, 20, it was created uh, like five days ago, I believe, um, through digital media. It's currently on, um, and it, it's an NFT art, non fungible token, and that is a whole different realm of, you know, putting it into the art world, you know. But with that, you know, her, you know, observing, you know, looking at this book, you know, it's a really unique book too as well. And just capturing this moment of her reading this, you know, that to me was like, wow, that's a connection of her, you know, taking that right foot and moving forward and understanding two worlds that she is um, moving towards, a traditional world and the modern world. And moving on to the next slide is a beautiful piece as well. Um, depicts, um, it's called The Walk in Beauty uh, 2021. That's a 2020 uh, digital media as well. And um, with this, I was uh, feeling experimental on, um, on handwritings and I was influenced with the Arabic handwriting styles. And with that, you know, when I work with the kids, you know, a lot of kids are currently, you know, especially with urban Native American teens who are disconnected with their culture. A lot of them would be into handwriting styles, uh, graffiti, you know, hip hop culture, but also gang culture too as well. But in order for me to have that connection with them, I introduced uh, a certain handwriting style that we used to do back in the day as um, indigenous people. So this piece was a, a piece that helped me grab the youth's attention of identifying themselves. And as you can see, this uh, piece at the top represented a um, uh, talking god. And the centerpiece right here is, um, is a dragonfly. And the dragonfly represents water in the Southwest tribes. And as you can see at the bottom of the, of the piece, uh, there was, there's corn and it slowly branches into a corn pollen boy and corn pollen girl. And with this centerpiece right here was the Red Road of Life, you know, in the way I call this piece of uh, knowing the balance of life. And there are so many teachings that I could, you know, connect with the kids with this, but also understanding like certain handwriting styles and identifying, you know, having that connection with the hip hop culture and indigenous culture, it's still the same in a way of how we represented ourselves but in the more um, positive aspect of it. And this next piece um, is a unique piece. I really enjoyed um, experimenting. Um, it's called Reverberations Reflected Through the Universe. As a 2021 acrylic on a canvas, I created this piece um, back in the um, in January, I believe. And with this, you know, as the hummingbird is more representation, is a, it's pretty much a universal representation that all cultures could connect with. It's a positive sign. And most times when I paint, I try to connect and try to be universal for the people that could connect it, connect to it. And um, my audience, again, like I said, is pretty much you know, with the youth, I work with the youth and with that, with them looking at art, with them knowing the stories behind what the hummingbird is, you know, I shared those um, oral stories and traditions with them, but the hummingbird represents um, beauty way, represents the moon crescent, represents uh, how cycles go about in our daily lives and how our emotions and how we speak with our inner winds and the inner winds that we speak as people is the first wind is of anger, fear, sadness, and happiness. And there's positive negative parts of these winds that when I work with the youth know how to express themselves through canvas. And um, next painting is a beautiful painting of a, a woodpecker. Um, it's called uh, Transitions of Color, Transition of Color. It's acrylic on a canvas, um, pretty much a love. Um, taking my time lately, I've been experimenting with realism. I started off with abstraction, then merging both worlds into, you know, something, you know, I'm always challenging myself. Um, with this uh, beautiful, unique piece, you know, 
I, you know, was a story that was shared by my elders about how the um, woodpecker saved fire and how he was pretty much represents as healing, as identifying and helping and assisting, you know, your spiritual identity. And with him, you know, connecting to youth, you know, with that, especially with our, my, the net people. And I tried to connect uh, other indigenous tribes as well. And it's like, you know, with art, you know, this is the only tool that I could, you know, assist and help them of identifying who they are as, you know, young adults and walking on that red road of life. And that is my PowerPoint slide. Thank you very much uh, for your just sharing a lot of your live life experiences um, and how they go into the work that you do. You know, always, always continuing to add new knowledge, new growth, new experiences to the things that you do and trying to pass that on to our youth. Uh, what I caught from your presentation, uh, for me, the word that, that popped out the most was reconnection. And you're that conduit that is helping our native youth to become reconnected to culture through the means of art. And that's very, that's super important. Um, at this time, we are running up on 630. So I do want to go back to our agenda. And what we have scheduled at this time is really to open up the floor to have an interactive discussion. So, you know, some of those questions and thoughts that you might have been um, ruminating on, uh, now is the time to just have that conversation amongst all of us. Um, and if you have a question, uh, if you're brave enough and want to turn on your cameras, please do so when you're asking your question because that goes a long way in connecting voice um, to this discussion and, and your identity to this to the discussion as well. Harm, do you want us to raise our hand? Oh, yes. Hi, Julie. Yes. Hi. Um, yeah, if you it, have a question, please, please raise your hand or uh, you could always put it in chat as well. All right, so we will go with um, Julie. You can um, ask your question now, and then we will hear from Sarah Schumann, who I see uh, her question in the chat. Okay, I was wondering, I noticed that like both artists said that um, their art was important to their, their health and well-being. Yet, um, like I heard Liv express that she leads a, a very busy life. You know, there's pressure on time at work and um, it sounds as if there's pressure within the family, of course, because she's raising children. And I remember when I was raising children, there was a lot of pressure. So I wondered how the, how the art helps alleviate that pressure and does sometimes do her, do both Garrett and Liv's artistic commitments add pressure to their life? Do they ever you know, what is the tension between adding pressure to your life and maintaining health? I guess that's what I'm wondering. Garrett, do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? Oh, yes, I can go first. All righty. So as for being an artist, um, being a counselor, you know, as you know, it was a with art, it helps me escape, you know, what stressors the clients are going through. And with that, it's more, you know, a connection through spirituality. And when I finish a painting, it helps me, you know, stay grounded and also pretty much, uh, you know, helps me like emotionally, helps me spiritually. And with that, you know, when I practice and I do work with my art, I take it in a more spiritual connection and I also you know as being native uh, I make offerings and I say prayers uh, to my pieces and I also feed it I think of my work as a spirit horse in a way where 
it helps and provides for me too as well. And I make sure that is it is fit, making sure that, you know, I, you know, I am taking care of it and the stories and whatever the creator is putting this, his finger on top of my head, you know, in a way it's like, I have to give back. And it's just kind of like, um, you know, I have to use this, you know, spiritual artistic expression for the youth for some reason. And it's my mission here on planet earth to do that. And when I do that, you know, I feel good too. Okay. So there's no pressure associated with like a deadline for your work or getting it. Yeah. It's more yeah. of a, than it ever is pressure. Yeah. I mean, as it's pretty much pressure when you first start off as an artist, uh, failure and repeat at first. Um, but I experienced a lot of failure. I invested, I don't know, hopefully I, I, I'm doing like 50,000 hours in order to be where I'm at, but I'm still, you know, investing that time. But when I do it, you know, it makes me feel good. But with uh, commission pieces and art, if I'm doing commission pieces to the people, um, that sometimes it does feel slightly pressured, but at the same time, it's like I'm enjoying it. And, you know, I just love it. Thank you. Thank you, Garrett. Um, I would I would reiterate the same type of release. And so, you know, being able to put your creativity, your feelings, your emotions, your day, your week, your month into a very just feel good activity is it just brings an immense sense of hope. And, you know, when, I, when I'm playing the piano, I play how I feel. And so if I'm happy, I'll play a happy piece. If I'm sad, I'll play a sad piece. And those are the times that my emotions will come through very raw. So oftentimes I'll play the piano and I'll be sitting there and I'll start crying and then I can't finish a piece because my emotions are so much in it. So for me, it's very much a release. Um, the painting, it for me has not yet become, um, you know, I don't, I don't have any pressure associated to it. For me, again, it's very much a release. I get to travel um, and I get to share an experience, a very, a very personal experience visually with a whole new community. And for me, that's, that's fun. And the travel part is fun too. And so I, you know, coordinate my professional art life with my professional behavioral health career. And so far it hasn't become, um, pressure ridden, I, I would definitely think of it as something that's very, just very welcomed at this time, especially with, with COVID. And, you know, I mentioned that art for me is a connector and it very much is because it, it, it reminds me of the time that I sat and did crafts with my grandma. And then during COVID, when we were quarantined very strictly and we weren't allowed to leave the home, you know, this is very early on in March of 2020 through like May and then the summer months, it, that's the time that we really pulled out all our crafts again. So my kids and I would sit at the table and we would just pile all our craft tools and say, what do you guys want to do today? And it was, it was a time for us to, to connect again and to enjoy being home, to enjoy being with one another and opening up conversation again. It sounds wonderful. Yeah, I definitely echo that. And thank you, Julie, for your question. Um, I am going to read off a question from Sarah Schumann. And I believe this is directed for Garrett, but Liv, if you want to chime in, please do so. The question is, um, you mentioned that urban youth may be more disconnected from their history. I wonder if you can say a little more about how you see this manifest. I think that was a Garrett question. Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, with that, you know, with the kids, um, you know, with them being here 
in Phoenix, um, certain cities that I assist and help them, you know, normally, you know, it's really difficult. Depends on, I mean, most kids would have the interest of connecting. Most kids would, you know, drift off towards gang violence, but in a way, if you could correct, um, create beautiful art, indigenous art, and the way I use for my pretty much the tools that I use is uh, through hip hop culture, you know, with um, pretty much the handwriting styles, um, hip hop, um, break dancing, um, you know, the MC and, um, you know, the DJ. And also I could, you know, when I connect both um, realms, like DJing would be the drummers, you know, the turn, um, the MC would be the spiritual chan chanters. Um, the sand painters would be the, the writers. You know, that's in a, in a way that's how I connected with them, with the, with the youth, and understanding of handwriting styles came from New York. But also, as Indigenous people, we also had unique handwriting styles. And with that, you know, with the kids understanding that and putting that seed out, you know, they could you know look at it you know, put it in their pocket or they could plan it later. So that's how I see, you know, them so far. Great, thank you. We have another question from Amanda Hunter and the question, it's a two-parter. So how do you both envision the future for indigenous health through art and culture is one question. And the second is, do you see the use of art becoming more mainstream as a form of treatment prevention, or do you think they should stay in their own realms? So again, this is open to the both of you. I'm just reading it again. That's a, that's a very good question. So I'll, I'll speak to this very quickly. Um, I would hope that it would become mainstream. Um, I would hope that we can utilize different tools and markets and um, art forms to really speak into indigenous futurism. So, um, you know, through art, we're each telling a story. Everyone has a personal story that we're sharing and you don't necessarily see it as soon as you see the picture. So I have Garrett's stickers, the one that he talked about with the dragonfly in the middle. I have that. I didn't know its symbolism or meaning before. And so it means so much more to me before, I mean, now than it did before. And so I think really using art is a means to capture attention from all walks of life. And it's engaging in, and of course it, it because there's a story housed in that. We need to project art more as a means to connect to people, as a means to say, hey, you know, like there's something really unique and exciting out there. Tell me more about that. And with that, we are, you know, we're relational people. Garrett and I both spoke, both spoke about, um, about being natural orators. And so our, our traditions are stories. They're not written down, they're, they're transmitted through stories. And so that's, that's what we live. And so through our art, we're communicating different types of stories. And I would, I would hope that we could use art as a means to motivate new conversations about what health and wellness means. So, I hope I answered all of those questions. Thanks for sharing, Liv. Yeah. As for me, you know, um, how I pretty much envisioned the future for Indigenous health through art and culture uh, is more reconnecting, more like a spiritual practice, but also, you know, about the mainstream, you know, in the form of treatment prevention, like you said, um, how would you stay in your own realm and how in a way, when I do, when I create art, um, there's two ways about it. I stay away from selling, you know, traditional pieces most times, and I have a different market for it as well with um, 
I teach the youth of learn how to, you know, support yourself, learn how to, you know, sell your product versus keeping things more for more spiritual practice. And a lot of my pieces, you know, it's more like of that teaching of Sparta woman, you know, providing for ourselves, providing income, providing and pretty much going out and about to bring food back on the table. So two ways about it. No, I have a universal style, which is not too in depth of cultural practices. I keep that separate versus, you know, what I have with, uh, you know, traditional practices. And that, you know, I try to help and pretty much educate the youth of, you know, keeping things um, sacred, you know. Great. Thank you both for answering that question. Now, our next question is for Liv from Lisa Dom. She says, you mentioned that your grandmother was very influential for you. Did she influence your arts? And when did you begin painting? Um, my grandma definitely influenced being creative. Um, she was so versatile in her skills and knowledge and she was an educator. Um, she kind of, same thing, just learned very easily. She didn't have a formal education, but she was able to watch and learn very quickly. And so that's what she did. And she taught me how to weave, um, you know, just our, so I'm, I, Growing up, my mother was a government employee. We moved all over the United States, but every summer I went home and lived with my grandparents. And so my that's, that's essentially what we did during summertime. We heard sheep and then we did crafts all day. She didn't have TV. And so it, those were my summer. Um, those were my, those were what my summer months look like as a youth. And um, she didn't really paint. I picked up painting when I think I first learned that I was sort of somewhat good at it when I was in fourth grade. I was going to school in California and our art class was entering into an, a local art contest for a community college in Walnut Creek, California. And the assignment was to, we were all given the same dragon we were supposed to turn it upside down and paint the picture upside down. And my picture happened to win the art contest. And that's sort of what started my, my painting career. That's so cute. That's so cute. I'm over here trying to imagine a little live. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. <laughs> All right, thank you for both answering that question. So we have um, another set of, set of questions from Amanda Hunter, and this one is geared towards digital art, okay? So she asks, will indigenous people be analyzing digital art and thinking about how it relates to our cultures today? And will digital art take the place of other traditional art forms? What do you both think about that? Alrighty, this is a fun, fun question. Um, yes, as a matter of fact, digital media would be very popular in the near future. At this point right now, if you go to OpenSea, majority of all Native American art is pretty much ripped off from certain artists and they were selling them by NFT. And NFT is a non-fungible token through Bitcoin and you have to open up an account with Ethereum. And with that, people are making money off us through indigenous, you know, with our artwork. And I see a lot of that. If you ever go through OpenSea, a lot of um, certain art that's being ripped off from certain artists here in the Southwest. And people would claim that, you know, it's authentic Native art. But in, in reality, you know, it's just actually them taking certain pieces. It was a picture or something. And they say it's Southwestern art. So uh, I took the step forward and I created an account with OpenSea. I created that NFT gallery page. Um, from there, I had this mindset that, you know, legit, you know, Native American non-fungible token art. And from there, you know, I truly believe it's going to be very popular. Bitcoin's popular, you know, if you ever are following with um, how Ethereum works, it's they say it's the crypto the it's pretty much the main 
income that's going to be here in the U.S. due to you know, decreasing of, of resources. So a lot of it on the digital media is just more, you know, taking care of our Mother Earth and try not to use too much materi uh, materials that, you know, we're trying to preserve. So digital is, is going to be a way. I truly believe that. So if you guys could, if you guys have an account with OpenSea, feel free to search me. I'm, I'm on there. And I'm still uploading my my NFT art. Thank you, Garrett. I shared the link to OpenSea just so everyone can be familiar with that. Um, NFTs are new to me. I just actually had this conversation a couple months ago um, and was asked to start contributing NFTs also. Um, I think digital art will not take the place of other traditional forms. I think people like tangible items and people like looking. There's something very ethereal about the experience of seeing something in person. And so, you know, something that comes to mind immediately and, you know, not, 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 not um, favoriting Garrett, but just because it's a memory that I hold very, it was just very powerful, and impactful. So we were at Indian Market a couple months ago and I've seen Garrett stuff on the internet, um, but to see it in person is a whole nother experience. And so to see his artwork and to like receive stickers and buy them, you see them on your like your water bottles and in your computer and you're like, I love this so much, but then to see where that came from. So to see a canvas and just to see the natural brush strokes and just to see the creativity behind something so elaborate and to think this didn't, this isn't digitized. Like somebody, Garrett's brain did this. <laughs> and that is like a whole nother experience. And so I don't think it'll replace it. Um, NFTs to me are, are, I don't know, a little bit scary. They're intimidating. Um, I don't want to give all my intellectual property to artificial intelligence right now. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that's kind of my take on all that. Great. Yeah, I definitely agree with you as far as being, you know, just that experience and the thrill of seeing something, seeing a painting up close in front of you, seeing the strokes and all of that, knowing that at some point, some person might have used like their actual hands and you can see fingerprints. And I think that speaks volumes about the investment that one puts into, you know, you're putting yourself into that art. And when you see it up close in person, it just hits differently. Um, okay. So folks, we are, you know, rounding up on our seven o'clock time and we want to be respectful of your evening time as well. Um, I'm going to give Alexandra the opportunity to ask the closing question, and then we will begin to wrap up our presentation here. Thank you, Carm. Um, thank you, Liv and Garrett. Uh, I've learned so much from you both tonight. But I guess a question to wrap our conversation today, basically, I want to know, how do you see art as a tool to document health injustice in your own communities and use art to push for policy change? Um, and with that, I guess, how do you see your role as indigenous artists um, in, an, in advancing health justice? Garrett, do you wanna Go, or would you like me to go? Oh, I could. Um, either way, you want to go? Paper, rock, scissor? <laughs> <laughs> the matriarch spoke, so Garrett, you have to go. <laughs> yeah, as a role, you know, moving forward with the indigenous um, culture, you know, with, um, with um, health justice, you know, moving forward is just pretty much grabbing these teachings that was shared from our, you know, our tribes and just 
you know, giving it to the youth. The youth is our main, should be our main primary audience or should be our main wants to focus on at this moment to, for us to give that seed to them and identify themselves. And with, without, you know, without those tools, you know, given into them, then we could, you know, understand what health justice is. I absolutely believe that policy changes can be made through art and it begins again with the conversation. So what the art represents, um, you know, there's a story embedded in it. I sign all my wall pieces whenever I do um, murals, either indoors or outdoors. I sign with a tiny little puzzle piece and that puzzle piece represents all the people that are on the spectrum, the autism spectrum specifically. And so I'm leaving a little insert there to capture someone's imagination or motivation to, you know, Google or ask the questions about what does that little puzzle piece mean? And from there, you know, you start the conversation from that one little piece, but then you start telling a, a bigger picture about the injustices and the unfairness and the inequalities that are happening in our local communities, in our indigenous communities, and then just on a global scale. And, you know, we start identifying the problems and the issues. And from there, we can start articulating and putting together um, sentences that start moving and pushing policy change. Thank you. I think that's a, a very poignant point to end on. Thank you very much um, this evening for the conversation, Liv and Garrett, and also to all of you who have stuck all the way through with us, have asked some excellent questions. Um, this was a lively discussion, and we couldn't have done this without our audience as well. What you see on the screen are information for both Liv and Garrett. Uh, Liv will be at the Flagstaff Shakespeare Festival on Friday, November 5th here in Flagstaff. So go check it, check her out and her artwork out. Um, and then Garrett, uh, you see there his Instagram and his Facebook accounts. And those are ways that you can connect. And very last of all, I have two slides that I wanna share. Um, you know, as I, as I mentioned in the very beginning, this Health, Health Justice Futures event is a bi-monthly event, but we have other things that we have going on under this umbrella campaign called Fairness First. And so if you go to this website here, you can learn about our different initiatives of how we are promoting conversations in the community about health justice, health equity, and fairness. Uh, we're also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And if you wanna carry on on the conversation onto an online space, uh, we would ask you, please use our hashtags that we have here at the bottom, hashtag health justice futures and hashtag fairness first camp and camp stands for campaign. So with that, um, now we wanna hear from you. Let us know what you thought about tonight's event, um, recommendations, suggestions, or even kudos about what we did um, well. So you can go to tinyurl.com forward slash HJF survey, or if you have your phone handy, you can also scan that QR code and it will take you right to that survey. Thank you again very much and have a safe, wonderful and relaxing evening. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.